worship with Plymouth Park United Methodist Church. My name is Marcus Womack, pastor here. I'm so glad you've chosen to worship with us today, this final Sunday of the Easter season, and this final Sunday in which we gather in this specific way. Um, We're so grateful that you're here. If you're worshiping with us through Facebook, we hope that you'll leave a comment and let us know what worship is like for you. If you're worshiping through our website, we'd love to hear from you. Please let us know how your week is going, how we can be praying for you as a church family. Maybe pause and take a moment from wherever you are joining us and light a candle. We're gathered around the light of Christ, and we know that wherever we are gathered from, it is the Spirit of God and the love of Jesus Christ that keeps us together as a church family. As I said, this is the final Sunday that we have pre-recorded a service. We will continue to have live broadcasts online at 11 a.m. moving forward, but we take some new steps in the coming days as a church family. If you're watching this before 11 a.m., you can join us for a time of prayer in our building where you can arrive and park in the parking lot and come journey through the different spaces that maybe you have missed and longed to see. We encourage you wear a mask as you do that and come and pray to prepare our hearts and lives to follow God's Spirit toward next Sunday. May 23rd is Pentecost. As we've talked about, that is the birthday of Christianity, and it is deeply tied to the beginnings of Plymouth Park United Methodist Church some 65 years ago. And we look forward to seeing you at 9.15 in our fellowship hall for P3 worship and at 11 a.m. in our sanctuary. These are our first steps, friends, and we hope that in the coming weeks and months that more and more of the things that make up our quote-unquote normal church life will begin to happen again. But we are so excited to take these next steps forward. As I said, we're encouraging wearing masks. You'll see unless one of us is talking or singing, we'll be wearing our masks in this time. There are new guidelines coming out, it seems, every few days from the CDC and other folks, and we are awaiting those uh, next steps from the North Texas Annual Conference and our best ways to live life together. So we appreciate your patience, your flexibility, and the care that we share for one another as we journey forward. Today is our final Sunday talking about let love rule and these conversations with 1 John. We hope that this has been a time of remembering the love of God that we know in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now we prepare our hearts to gather around that love in worship.
Good morning. Would you please join me in the call to worship? We worship God who created the heavens and earth. God's reign endures forever. We follow Jesus who made God's love known to us through his life, death, and resurrection. We listen for the Holy Spirit who breathes in us and grants us wisdom and insight. Come, worship our God together. Celebrate all the ways God is made known to us now. service where we remember the prayers of our community and our world and take our petitions to God. 
We have no new prayers to share for health and healing or for sympathy, and we uh, ask that if you have ongoing concerns or would like to be added to the prayer list, to please contact our church office. Also, we have an ongoing list of prayer concerns that is updated regularly that goes through the All Church emails. Please contact us if you do not receive those things. And we know we live in this season of change for our church. We live in this season of life in our world where uh, there is conflict in the Holy Land and there is uncertainty still ahead of us with the pandemic as though there are glimmers of hope, there are still questions to be answered. And then there are the daily things that you and I carry, friends, where we seek the Spirit of God to give us strength. So we come in this moment and we ask, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to respond, hear our prayers, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Let us pray. Holy God, you are with us in our waking and in our rising. As the psalm says, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, still your hand will hold me fast and guide me. Or there are days where we feel like we sink to the depths and even there you find us. You've searched us. You know us. You are familiar with all of our ways. And you tell us, Lord, that even before our words can utter the needs of our hearts, before we can even identify with our eyes and make sense in our minds of the hurts and hopes of our world, You are there, your spirit, uttering on our behalf the petitions that we dare yet to name. May we feel you alongside us. Your abiding love. The image you have created in us the beacon of hope you give us in Christ who leads us. Your spirit that sustains us. We offer our prayers to you this day, O God, and we offer you our lives. As we pray those familiar words from St. Francis that say, make us an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, pardon where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that we would not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. Remind us, Lord, that it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born again to life eternal. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hey everyone, I'm Jack. And I'm Krista. And we want to welcome you to Sacred Science. Science. I see, I think, and I wonder. So we've had some really, really cool experiences. We have. It's been so much fun. Yeah, and we've had some really great questions, which we are able to relate to science and faith. It's been super amazing. And I've had so much fun with this. Me too. Yeah. But today, we have a really, really good question. And I feel like we need to figure this out. We do. Let's hear it. All right. So I see God creating things every day, big and small. We're also creating things every day. Do you think they can all fit into the kingdom of God? I wonder how big the kingdom of God really is. That was a really, really good question. It was a good question. I think, I think we can figure it out. 
approach you? We've done it so far, Jack. All right, three, two, one, Here we break. Go. Get somebody to help you. This is a fun one. We are going to use one cup of hydrogen peroxide. The same stuff you use when you get a scraper or a cut, and you know how it bubbles on your hand when you, when you put it on a scraper or a cut? Mm, no, thank you. Okay, so we've got a plastic bottle, and we've got a, a big tub because it's going to catch some things for us, okay? So Jack's going to pour that hydrogen peroxide right into the bottle. Have you guys noticed that Jack's a really great pourer? I am not. All right, so we've got our hydrogen peroxide in the bottle. Now we're just gonna add some dish soap to it. Cool. We're just gonna give it a couple of squirts. Any color dish soap will do. We're gonna put that right into our bottle. Now, if you want to add food coloring to this, you can. Jack's gonna grab a couple of um, different colors, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna put it down the side of the bottle so it actually drips, but we're gonna try to stripe our elephant toothpaste. Okay, now we are going to take what is called dry yeast and we're going to put in two single packets or if you have a tube of yeast, you can grab your measuring spoon and you want to measure out two heaping tablespoons of yeast to put into the cup. And then while Jack's doing that, I'm going to get our pitcher of water. We've got some warm water and warm is important and we're going to add six big tablespoons of warm water to our yeast, and we're gonna stir that for about 60 seconds. How you doing over there, Jack? Getting there. <laughs> and we're gonna add some water. One, two, two three, three, four, four five, six. six, and I'm gonna add two more because we kinda got some spill over here. Eight. Spoon. Here we go. And Jack, give that a really good stirring. Give us power, Jack. All right, now we're gonna pour our active yeast ingredient into our bottle. Are we ready to see what's gonna happen? All right, brace yourself. Here we go. And our active ingredient goes. Uh, Not bad. Better. Here it comes. Oh, look, it's getting better over here. You can yeah. see the green stripe. Wow. There's the red one. That's so amazing. not real toothpaste. It is not. Please don't use it on your teeth. Don't even use it on your pet elephant's toothpaste. <laughs> so just thinking about what we did takes me to the question that was asked. And it takes me to Matthew 13. So, like we do every week, if you don't have a Bible, tell us. We're going to give you one. But you're going to turn to the book of Matthew, which is the first book in the New Testament. So, I told you about this trick last week, but you're going to split your Bible in half, and you should get to around Isaiah, Psalms, and then you're going to take the back half of the thing that you split, and you're going to split it in half again. And look, I just went straight to Matthew. Nice. So, you're going to find the big number 13. So, big number 13. And today, we're not really going to read the scripture, but what I want you to do is just to read and look throughout the whole chapter of Matthew 13. In this chapter, we see all kinds of parables about Jesus talking about little things that really change everything and create the kingdom of God. So in one parable, there's some yeast that he talks about. And he relates it to the kingdom of God of how the yeast is spread out and it makes the bread. It does. And so little things that we can do in the world that will then create the kingdom of God in the world. Now you might ask, Christy, you're probably thinking, what is the kingdom of God? I was. I was wondering it. Yeah, so the kingdom of God is what God calls us to create down here on earth. 
So when, as Christians, we are called to act differently, we are called to speak differently, we're called to just be different than, than other people. That's right, and, and to so, serve differently. Absolutely. And so little things like serving your community that you're in, collecting cans, um, just being nice. That's right. Um, there are all ways that we can really spread the kingdom of God. And you don't just do it here in person. You can do it online, teenagers. You can spread the kingdom of God on TikTok and Twitter. Um, and those are great ways to spread that as well. I love that, Jack. Yeah. Using our faith and our action and our service and our witness as a catalyst to spread God's love and to make His kingdom on earth here as big as we possibly can make it. Yeah, definitely. Bigger than the elephant too. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. So we hope that you have enjoyed exploring science because so many people have said you can't connect to faith and science. So we hope that you have joined us in exploring how faith and science works together. And we hope that you will take this time to then go explore on your own about how science and faith and all other aspects of the world can be connected to God. That's right. And keep a watch out because you never know when we just might throw out a random science experience out there to relate to scripture. That's just right. Here and there. It could be fun. That's right. All right. We'll see you. Take care. Hear my humble cry While on others thou art calling Do not pass me by Amen. We have been so blessed every week in these services. 
that we've recorded in this way. Uh, I have personally felt the blessing of the creativity, the adaptability, the vibrancy of the gifts of the team who bring these services together in this way week after week for these past many months. Um, yes, we just heard from our P3 band and Pat Horner's wonderful rendition of those words of faith that have shaped so many of us. Um, the P3 team and band led by Krista has been so faithful and adaptive in their response. Friends, we're surrounded by our choir and our music ministry in this space led by Dr. Michael Lindstrom and Ken Surley. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, to the sacred science that we are engaging and all of the wonderful ways that Krista Bailey and Jack Payne and Caitlin Snowdy have sought to reach and stay connected to and enliven the discipleship of our young people. Uh, yeah, I'm biased. I've got kids who respond to that as well. But friends, that is so vital for our church all the time and in this season. Um, Reverend Roger Wells from Alves is having some time of Sabbath and time with family during this time today, but for her continued presence alongside our community in care and in service. To those who are helping in so many ways in vital ministry to make all of this happen, that looks like Cheryl Noble and Kathy Bongfeld, who are running the media in this space this evening for those who have gathered here. It looks like behind the scenes how Kathy and Carol Jones and Judy Lawrence show up day in and day out again and again to do the vital ministries that keep us connected and keep us moving. And certainly, friends, it includes uh, the ministry and presence of Tom Rubeck, who's behind the other side of this camera. Uh, we, before the service, gave him a round of applause of gratitude. But friends, I'm going to invite you wherever you are worshiping from. And again, friends, to, to thank Tom Rubeck. Uh, Tom, we're really grateful for the ways that you've stepped in alongside Jeff Bongfelt and Trevor Nicholas and all those who have helped behind the scenes. But uh, Tom, you have given so much of your time, your energy, and your creativity to bring so much of this together. And it has truly been an irreplaceable gift to our church family to stay connected in such a vibrant way and a meaningful and significant way. Thank you, Tom. Friends, that may just be my sermon today. I may uh, just end that note of gratitude. But no, we're, we're here gathered around the love of God. That truly is our foundation in this season and in every moment. And we bear witness to the love of God and the scriptures we've received. And so we turn again in this concluding chapter in this final Sunday of the Easter season to 1 John chapter 5. If we receive human testimony, God's testimony is greater because this is what God testified. He has testified about his son. The one who believes in God's son has the testimony within. The one who doesn't believe God has made God a liar. Because that one has not believed the testimony that God gave about his son. And this is is the testimony. God gave eternal life to us, and this life is in his Son. The one who has the Son has life. The one who doesn't have God's Son does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of God's Son so that you know that you have eternal life. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God of love and God of grace, this is your time and we are your people. Open our hearts, our minds, and our lives to your presence that we would receive your word and respond with all that we are. Amen. I've said it a couple of times. This Sunday marks the end of what sometimes is called the Great 50 Days. 
that we remember Easter is not just one day on our calendars, friends. Easter is the ongoing reality of Christian existence. And we let Easter reverberate week after week in our lives and in our worship to hopefully instill in us in the smallest details of our lives and through our worship the hope of resurrection, the hope of the truth we proclaim, that death doesn't have the final say, that all of the chaos that we endure in this life, all of the bad news that we encounter, will not ultimately define us. We walk week after week in a season of Easter to have the firm foundation underneath our feet that love wins. Initially, these words were written to the early church who had many questions about whether or not love was actually going to win. Some of these maybe had journeyed in the crowds alongside Jesus. We think 1 John was written in the same school of folks who authored the Gospel of John. And who could hear the faint echoes of Christ as he walked this earth a generation or two later. Who looked to the heavens wondering, is this truly the end of the story, the suffering that we endure? Or is there more? This testimony to the life eternal, not just the escape hatch to get out of the sufferings of this world when our time has come, but that our lives are not defined by the contradictions and pains of this life and that we have an alternative story to offer. That is the testimony of the good news for the early church. And friends, when I think about the lives that we have lived in the past year plus, As I have looked around saying, is this the story that we are confined to? Is this the end of the road? Is there more? I stand in need of that testimony that says, the bad news, the chaos, the conflict, the uncertainty, that is not the defining characteristic of your story, Marcus. That is not the defining characteristic of your story, Plymouth Park United Methodist Church. When I hear these words of an ultimate vision of God's testimony of love and grace through the person of Jesus Christ, I'm reminded of those words of the poet Kenneth Boulding who said, Yet love is weak, and hate is strong. Hate is short, and love is very, very long. I hold to that hope when I imagine the early church. When I imagine the early church who was met with a rush of hatred and conflict and chaos in the lead up to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, I think of those early disciples and those early followers for whom Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and that wait, that wait through Holy Saturday, that that must have felt like an eternity. It must have felt like hate was going to win. It must have felt like the darkness was going to define them. And that hope was lost. It must have felt like the hate was very strong and that the love was very weak. For they were encouraged by these letters of hope, by the witness of the empty tomb, by the presence of the Holy Spirit whose coming we will mark next week at Pentecost. That as powerful as the forces of darkness may seem, they are so brief when compared to the universal and eternal presence of the love that has created us. 
in the grand scheme of the love that began in the beginning and created all things, that it reverberated through the story of God's people and was embodied in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that that love would make even the most powerful of darkness and the most weighty of hatred, sin, death, and evil seem so short. And how very, very long love will endure. Friends, I'm not just talking about the early church and their struggles today. I am talking about you and me. The early church was called to give testimony even when the odds seemed against them. To give testimony to the love of God they knew in Jesus Christ. And as we know, having been in conversation with 1 John for several weeks now, that testimony is not only in the words we say or the ideas that we think. It was testimony through the ways they would live love. This letter of 1 John tells us you can't say I love God and then turn around and hate your neighbor. You can't say, oh, I have all the love in my heart and then turn around and not share it. We give testimony in how we live and that was the call of the early church and we see it throughout the New Testament. The testimony of love that welcomes more in, that shares food with the hungry, that gives healing to those in need, that stood alongside the suffering, saying you are not alone. We are invited to join in that testimony, friends. We're invited to see our very identities as reshaped by the season of Easter. To locate ourselves in the story. We do this liturgically because we mark that time. We mark the waiting of the Last Supper and the waiting of the cross and the waiting of Holy Saturday. And the release and the joy of the empty tomb on Easter Sunday. And friends, there's a reason why we have three days for the death. And 50 days that we mark the time of love conquering death. First John asks, will we join in the chorus giving testimony to how much greater love is? What is your testimony to love? Now, in some traditions, maybe asking to give your testimony, maybe that feels familiar. For some of you, that may feel different. Maybe it conjures up images of like a a courtroom proceeding. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Or as Aaron Sorkin would say, you want the truth, you can't handle the truth. We give testimony in those settings to get the facts straight and more so to point to the truth. And our faith story, the same is there. Yeah, there are traditions, and I've I've participated in some of those traditions where maybe you're called to testify. So who's first? We'll just open mic night today. Now, some of you at home may say, I'll be right there, Marcus. I'll I'll be right there. We'd love to receive your testimony, but I'll go today. It didn't always look like maybe a uh, Holy Spirit-led service or uh, more Pentecostal than United Methodist it always is, but sometimes given my testimony looked like being on a youth mission trip. And we'd give testimony in how we lived every week. We'd build stucco homes in Ciudad Juarez just across the border from El Paso. And we'd camp out in the desert and have a a fire every night where we'd cook dinner and tell stories. And especially towards the end of the week, we'd go around the campfire telling the story, telling the facts of the week and telling the truth of our experiences 
and maybe where we were surprised by the presence of God. I don't know if you've ever felt this, but I've certainly had that experience on a mission trip of thinking I'm going to take the good news to someone, that they've been living in darkness, and here comes super Christian Marcus to come bring you the light, only to be surprised and glad surprise that God's light was already there. So we would tell those stories of encountering in the neighbors whom we were serving that the image of God was already there welcoming us and inviting us deeper into community. Or being at, at church camp. I've talked about some of those experiences before. The hillside at Bridgeport overlooking the lake at sunset. You'd be in small groups during the week talking about scripture. You'd be in worship two or three times a day. Towards the end of the week, though knowingly when I became a camp counselor, we started calling it cry night, um, for better or worse. Students were offered to tell the stories of transformation that happened in the week. Friends, I first articulated a call to ministry on a Thursday night at church camp. When I felt I was singing in worship and felt a presence of home and belonging that I had not felt before. And I felt a resonance in the Bible study in small groups of a story that I wanted to commit myself to in a way I hadn't felt before. I got to tell the facts of that story in my life in the truth of the reverberating presence of love that wouldn't let me go. I think we each have different chapters of our lives where we are invited to give testimony, where we are invited to embody and live in, not just with the words of our mouth or the ideas in our minds, but with the actions we take. I felt that in times where I did not have the words. And I wasn't sure what the ideas were supposed to look like. I'm telling you, friends, from the time that I was in sixth grade confirmed to the time that I graduated high school, I felt so alive and at home in the youth ministry. I felt so alive and at home in the church. I was surprised to find after my first year of college when I had the next logical step of a job in a youth ministry with First Methodist Richardson where I spent all summer doing the things I loved to do as a youth group member. Three mission trips, three different church camps, other retreats and Sunday school lessons and other things. I hit a wall. We were in some experiences. I was teaching junior high Sunday school and helping lead a junior high church camp. And my boss at the time, his name's Charles Harrison, he looked at me and said, all right, the, we need a preacher for this night. Will you tell some of your story? And I looked at him and said, I'm, I don't think I can. I want to pause on this for a minute. I was in a job where I was trying to make a good impression, in a job where I was being asked to do a certain thing, and I said no to doing a pretty critical function of my job. It's amazing I was not fired that summer, friends. But... I found myself looking at my own story and my own testimony from a different perspective. And where I was at that moment was a different place than where I was two years before or five years before. I didn't have the words to offer a seventh grader when I saw seventh grade Marcus staring back at me with hope and expectation and anticipation. I looked at him and said, I think it's more complicated than what you're expecting me to say right now. I want to tell you it's all going to be okay. I want to bear witness to the resurrection in a way that is tidy and clean and makes sense in three points in a poem. But it may be more complicated than that. And I'm not sure I can wrap my vocabulary around that or wrap my thinking around that yet. In my heart, I've started calling that my summer of silence. And the joke is I'm a very extroverted person and I talk a lot. So yeah, maybe I could do for another summer of silence in my life. But here we are. 
What became very clear to me about my testimony as I've looked back on that summer where I didn't have the words and I didn't have the clear picture in my mind that I had at the moment I felt called at church camp or the moments around the fire in Ciudad Juarez. What I felt instead was the testimony of actions, the community that had surrounded me, and that witness that we often attribute to one of my spiritual heroes, St. Francis of Assisi, that says, proclaim the gospel at all times, but only if necessary, use words. Friends, I still live in that tension of that space of uh, absolutely wanting the right words and ideas to meet all the problems of the world. I want to be able to pray the perfect prayer at a hospital bedside that is going to ease every worry. I want to have the perfect passage of Scripture when there is doubt and uncertainty, either in our hearts personally or in the world around us, to proclaim that the Prince of Peace truly has the power to bring peace in this moment. I want to have all the wisdom for all of the questions we faced in the past year plus for how we worship together or how we gather. Oftentimes my words fail. Oftentimes my ideas either are not big enough or not nuanced enough. But the invitation is still there. Will I give testimony to the love of Jesus Christ that endures and reverberates through the darkness and the chaos and the conflict? My hope is that even in the imperfect ways, that my presence has been there alongside you. And I hope that is true for any of us. Because we have a world that watches the actions of the church universal wondering, will we give life to the testimony of the love of Jesus Christ? I hope that even when my words fail, you can look at my life and see what I'm about and what gospel I'm proclaiming through my life. Yeah, there are times you're going to look at my life and see that I love Whataburger and I love the Longhorns and I love the Beatles. But I also hope that you see my dedication to my family my care for each of you and my heart for the love of God that binds us together. That's my prayer. How I endure to follow that has looked differently over time, but it is my commitment. I want to close with a passage that is speaking into my testimony right now and seeking a faithful call I talked to some of our church leaders uh, several months ago. This is a sign you have a millennial pastor. I saw something on Twitter that really spoke to me. There was an opportunity through Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. Yes, where Jack Payne received his master's degree. They somehow are letting me participate in a program there. I hope I'm worthy to the reputation of Jack Payne Day and all that comes with it. But I saw they had a program about leadership in the church through the life and witness of Reverend Howard Thurman. You've maybe heard me quote him before. He's, like St. Francis, one of those spiritual heroes of mine. He was a mentor and a generation ahead of Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights leaders in the 1960s. And he journeyed in a particular way against the hate and darkness and conflict and chaos of his time as an African-American man in America to bear witness to the love of Jesus Christ. I think his voice resonates with the early church bearing witness to the resurrection in light of the evidence and to you and I. So I want to read a passage, a meditation of his called The Glad Surprise as a vision of our testimony to resurrection and the love of God.
the glad surprise. There is ever something compelling and exhilarating about the glad surprise. The emphasis is upon glad. There are surprises that are shocking, startling, frightening, and bewildering. But the glad surprise is something different from all of these. It carries with it the element of elation, of life, of something over and beyond the surprise itself. The experience itself comes at many levels. The simple joy that comes when one discovers that the balance in the bank is larger than the personal record indicated. And there is no error in accounting. The realization that one does not have his door key, the hour is late and everyone is asleep, but someone very thoughtfully left the latch off, just in case. The dreaded meeting in a conference to work out some problems of misunderstanding, and things are adjusted without the emotional lacerations anticipated. The report from the doctor's examination that all is well when one was sure that the physical picture was very serious indeed. All of these surprises are glad. There is a deeper meaning in the concept of the glad surprise. This meaning has to do with the very ground and foundation of hope about the nature of life itself. The manifestation of this quality in the world about us can best be witnessed in the coming of spring. It is ever a new thing, a glad surprise, the stirring of life at the end of winter. One day there seems to be no sign of life, and then almost overnight, swelling buds, delicate blooms, blades of grass, bugs, insects, an entire world of newness everywhere. It is the glad surprise at the end of winter Often the same experience comes at the end of a long tunnel of tragedy and tribulation. Are you with me? It is as if a man stumbling in the darkness, having lost his way, finds that the spot at which he falls is the foot of a stairway that leads from darkness into light. Such is the glad surprise. This is what Easter means in the experience of our humanity. This is the resurrection. It is the announcement that life cannot ultimately be conquered by death. That there is no road that is at last swallowed up in an ultimate darkness. That there is strength added when the labors increase. That multiplied peace matches multiplied trials. That life is bottomed by the glad surprise. Take courage, therefore. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when, we're, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our God's full giving is only begun. May it be so, friends. Amen. Amen. We now join our voices and unite as we read and recite the affirmation of faith, found on page 883. Will you join me? We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
friends, every week when we gather. We are invited to receive the word proclaimed and then to respond. It is our way of giving testimony, friends. Not only with our financial resources, but that those resources are a sign of our entire lives. Joining the work of God's love that will very long reverberate beyond our very lives. We're so grateful for the ways you've continued to be so generous to make ministry possible in this season and friends to truly plant the seeds that will cultivate ministry as we take our next steps toward in-person worship or in-person gatherings and how that will continue to evolve. You can give online. You can mail your generosity to our church office. You can text to give. We're so grateful for the ways you have already responded. Through some of your gifts, we were able to invest immediately into the software and hardware needs of internet broadcasting our worship in the coming weeks to make our live broadcast as smooth as possible. Uh, We even have some money beginning to be dedicated towards a potential part-time staff person in that. We will keep you updated. But we also continue to invite you, if you feel called to invest in those ministries, and if you feel called to respond through your generosity, to contact Carol Jones or myself as we journey towards that investment and what that turns into through relationship. Will you pray with me? God, all that we have and all that we are begin in you. We offer you our gifts, our resources, our time, and our very lives, that the ways we have been blessed would be a blessing to all we encounter in this journey through your creation that all may know the love we have found and testify to in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen.
this Easter celebration to give our testimony. Yes, maybe if necessary with our words and our ideas, but always with our lives. Offering that hope, that love endures, that love we know eternally. And the God who creates us, Christ who makes us whole in the Holy Spirit, who sustains us in this journey of life and faith that we share together. Go in peace. Amen.
that's a wrap.